Um, we're just going to start with a, a small video, a short video. So this paper came about after our um, Holden tour last year at the last conference where we walked through the Elizabeth plant uh, two weeks before it, it shut and we were wondering about sort of I suppose this year what's actually happened and I come to this particular problem as somewhat of an outsider I suppose looking at the automotive industry from the outside in as a research fellow in sustainability and all of the conundrums around sustainability and, and transport mobility um, climate change, all sorts of things, and also in terms of my design practice, certainly outside of the automotive industry, and in more in consulting and appliances, and and still in a role um, with Glowpair. So I don't know about you guys, but when I see that kind of operation and all of the innovation that's gone into building manufacturing plants that can do that and assemble vehicles in that kind of way. I'm continually gobsmacked. Like, I'm, I'm seriously um, r ruining the day that we lose these capabilities here in Australia. And I've come from this from the upfront perspective, so um, as a designer, a car designer. So I was working with the, car, the, the clay modellers. I'd sketch the sketch that the clay modellers would, would model. We'd make the car go down the assembly line and then we see it coming off the other end. Um, and now I'm coming, and so that was the sort of top-down design pr approach, but now I'm sort of coming at making from the grassroots open source design approach, which I spoke about two years ago. But yeah, there was, there's some amazing reasons for the, the automotive manufacturing side of things to be in Australia or to have been in Australia. Um, and these things are going to be lost to us now. Um, 
So as a particularly looking at how um, uh, design engineering and expertise feeds into our innovation, which feeds into our tertiary industries. And, and Giorgio, your, your, wherever you are, your presentation, there you are, your presentation is, a, is an amazing demonstration of how the automotive industry has influenced, or the affordances of the automotive industry has influenced other industries um, and really um, sparked innovation. And even in the adaption of those um, methods of, of manufacturing, that, um, that that innovation just flourishes. There's a, there's a great paper by Cliborne, Lansbury and Wright in, I've forgotten the journal name, uh, Economic Papers in 2016, which really sums up all of these points extremely well. Um, there were obviously issues in Australia that, that um, meant that the automotive industry couldn't survive in the way that it had. But we're, we're interested, um, and so these, these are sort of the, the, the again, the top-down types of, of reasons why. So, um, and particularly, you know, the Australian dollar, the way that it sort of, it, it strengthened and made our exports less viable internationally. Um, but then all the infighting and the government issues and union interventions all added up to this, this um, big issue that, that ended ended badly for the manufacturing industry. So we, we thought we'd look at some of the predictions moving into um, the, the manufacturing shutdown and then try to figure out whether some of these predictions have actually come to pass. I mean, it hasn't been a very long time since, since it's actually happened, so we, we're sort of not even mid-cycle yet, we're sort of right at the beginning of the cycle of seeing, seeing what, um, what is going to eventuate from this. So yeah, the dire predictions of, I mean the predictions fluctuate immensely from 40,000 to 200,000 job losses. Um, we've got diversifying industry um, uh, and a rise in service, services economy which we'll talk about a little bit more um, later, but that all of this sort of culminates in social upheaval. As to date, there hasn't been a really detailed study that collects all of this information into one place and, prevents, and presents it um, as a cohesive study. There have been quite a few studies that, that have um, uh, tried to, uh, in the lead up to the closures, um, have tried to, to say what's going to happen, but um, as yet there hasn't really been a clear one that says what has happened. But we do know that there, are, at minimum, have been 5,700 jobs lost. To date, but that doesn't take into account our tier one and two suppliers. But we don't know what the re repercussions of those are going to be uh, in uh, the entire Australian industry, particularly if we take, you know, some of the the affordances that Giorgio's presentation highlights. We don't know how many of those affordances have actually taken place over time, and what the implications of not having these innovative cycles coming in. So really, uh, we looked to explore this idea of jobs and roles and skills. Um, and we looked to do that through interviews, um, which looked at the predictions that Mark's just um, articulated. Um, I mean, the Productivity Commission in 2014 said there was a need to reflect, and there hasn't been much reflection going on, um, apart from uh, sort of pockets of of research and, and mostly economic modelling, to be frank, uh, not social reality or, you know, explorations around people. Um, so we really wanted to find out what, what's really happened to car manufacturing operations and sites following the plant's closing last year. Uh, and what does that mean for Australia? And embedded within that is also roles, skills, expertise, etc. Um, similar, I suppose, to the previous two papers I did uh, in this conference uh, for the previous two years. We used a series of stakeholder interviews, um, experts who are still within the industry and who have recently departed or, or long departed but have still a very strong connection. Roles spanning from you know, many decades uh, at all the major uh, manufacturers when they ceased and also uh, top tier suppliers as well. We got 
five out of the six, which is great. Um, but obviously that means we'll talk about limitations a bit later. Um, so we used a qualitative descriptive analysis and, and we worked inductively. We just tried to flesh this out as people were describing their experiences and, and the knowledge that was embedded within it. And four key themes really developed as we, we went through these interviews and then looked to synthesise that those data. So first one was a was a <laughs> fairly apparent one, changes to industry sites and urban development, which I'll cover off next. Plant and resource shifts, which is again fairly tangible and fairly, you know, we can sense that just by looking at what's going on. The final two themes Mark will cover off, which are probably less overt and need some more a lot more digging. Uh, but we're going to start that process today. So industry roles and skills and cultural shifts that have developed from uh, the ceasing of manufacturing. So in terms of changes to industry sites and urban development, uh, we had a few of our interviewees quite an extensive knowledge of what's actually going on in Elizabeth. <coughs> um, it's public knowledge now that a Victorian consortium has bought the site and they're going to be using it for crane assembly and a bit of manufacturing. Um, interestingly, there's been no demolition to this point within a year. Um, and also Holden is actually leasing space in that site still because they have five to seven year of um, projections apart requirements for models at least um, to service. And, and that site you know, built for storage as well. I mean, they were supplying other suppliers around Australia through that site, you know, from the you know, last century, mid -se last century onwards. So. Um, that's sort of what's going on at the moment with the site perspective. With Fisherman's Bend, I think Norm covered a lot of this off f fairly succinctly. Um, there's only a few buildings left though, and a few have been demolished. In fact, uh, John's still working in one, the tech centre, uh, the, uh, the V6 engine plant and HQ, that beautiful old uh, looking building at the front, purpose built. Um, but many of the of the sites that Norm described certainly been repurposed, and we'll talk about that in a second, the roots, AMI, all those other buildings. Other sites, so this is a photo from one of our uh, interviewees of the Woodville plant, which is now a skeleton. It's been declad and it's basically sitting there as a, um, yeah, a, a shell. Uh, I mean, there's potential that'll be repurposed. Uh, Pagewood, th this is years ago, flattened, um, and it's now apartments up in New South Wales. And interestingly, Dandenong, is now a spare parts hub, but also a transport hub, so one of the big uh, logistics companies using that site. In terms of sort of uh, changes um, that are going on now and in the future, so projected changes at Elizabeth, there's talk uh, apparently with a new owner about a museum that potentially is going in in the staff. There's talk of it being in the staff canteen, which is quite a large open area. You could actually get vehicles in there and, and display, uh, potentially even bring in vehicles that are still out at um, National Motor Museum as well and complement the archive, which the archive we saw last year is still there and still being looked after by a number of people. Um, Fisherman Ben's, Fisher, Fisherman's Ben's plans, uh, at the moment there's quite a lot of talk and planning um, projection going on with the State Department around what's actually going on and obviously a lot of political debate about what's going on with that as well uh, between the two major parties. There was talk again of the BAE Army vehicle potentially going, but that contract was won out of Queensland to qu quite a lot of fanfare by their government. Um, if we look at sort of, I suppose, what's going on more statewide and nationally, uh, there's still these niche manufacturers who service particular industries really, really well. You think of Kenworths, you know, Talus doing the Bushmaster out of out of Bendigo, or you know, the Elfins, you know, Albans doing uh, transmissions and, and actually transporting those logistics-wise internationally because they're high, highly regarded transmissions. But what can actually happen, it, you know, as Norm alluded to, you know, some of these sites in Fisherman's Bend in particular, interestingly, are, are repurposed for something else. So AMI is now Delft, I think it was. Norm, Delft, that's right, the tap warehouse. That's just the head office. Yep. There's still a lot of vacant land. Yep. Factories used to see them. And they've been demolished. And root site is, is now Lobex um, luxury cars. What can you know? What's happening with the plan and resources? You know, within a year of these closures, uh, one interviewer in particular had a lot to to contribute on this this front. So, I, this particular interviewee sort of described what happened with the closure. 
Pretty much as we left, the press shop was shutting down. Within an, another week, the body shop was shut. Um, and then within two days before closure, the paint shop, the Elpo factory was actually shut down and General Assembly was basically that fi those final photos that you see of the, the group around the last car uh, and that was it. But interesting with walkthroughs, up until very recently, July, late July, very little plant and machinery has gone. So, you know, they're starting to sell off in order basically of high yield. So what can they get the best return for quickly? And that has started in the press shop. So that has been gutted. Presses and tools, high value, potentially were sort of the later things that were brought in, particular models, and, and then being shipped out. Interesting, a whole lot of robots just sitting there. They've all been plasticed up, taped up, and they're just sitting there. And one of the comments around that was potentially, you know, the, they're not the newest robots in the world. I mean, we were wowed by that system, but I mean, they're still 10, 12 years old. So potentially that's still something they're going to have to think about um, maybe around, um, I mean, when we were there, I think they were talking about those going pretty quickly. They're, they're not, they're, they're actually still in. I think another comment we were there was about this Elbow factory, um, the, the electro painting. Uh, that's a, again something that was quite newly installed and potentially very saleable. I think they were selling the paint that was out of that when we were there. The, the certain grade of anti-corrosion paint was going to Thailand. Um, the plant manager when we were walking around another day was saying, but that plant is still there as well. So again, there's a process going on, but it's, it's a slow process and it's not necessarily maybe as we thought it was going to be. I mean, I think my perceptions on the day was this is going to get it done pretty quick. So the automotive industry had an immense um, range of, of people and skills who had uh, uh, enormous capability in their roles. Through our interviews, it was, it was interesting to hear um, the, our, our interviewees talking very similarly about the way that the automotive industry stood in our, um, in our local culture. Um, that investment, because investment decisions were over a 20 year time frame, there was a stability for the rest of the industry. And the just-in-time method of production also meant that there was um, uh, security for suppliers who, uh, you know, uh, they'd have a range of parts ready to go. It would go out the door. They didn't need the storage necessarily to, to hold on to it. The automotive industry didn't need the, uh, the storage to hold on to it either. It would go straight onto the cars. And so this seamless well, production line sort of meant that there was a secure system that people were interacting with. Um, that automotive rigour in this respect, because of all of these ways of going about things, they needed to be very tightly timed and, um, and figured out and that rigour transferred into the whole industry. Um, and it contained multi-generational knowledge, so how to do things, but not just how we do them, it was why we do these things in the first place. And that why um, is something which builds over generations. Um, the how can easily be made, uh, can, can easily be conveyed, but the why is a lot longer to, to understand. So this means that the um, tier one, tier two suppliers had access to contemporary technologies and there was a reason for them to use those contemporary technologies. Um, and they also understood the rigour of um, contractual relationships with a large organisation. But now because that has disappeared, um, there's, there's not only the, the vacuum with, with, within that rigour but there's the vacuum between the technologies, technologies themselves and future technologies which could take us 20 years, 25 years, maybe 50 years to actually get up to speed with in the way that we did with automotive manufacturing. And in addition to that, that designing things, in, in designing things, we need to know how to make them. The most effective designers are the ones that understand the whole, whole of process. So um, I don't think we, took enough credit for the amount of innovation that went out to the rest of the world. 
one of our interviewees was saying, you know, I don't know if you realise this, but the ter Territory Stability Control was a global benchmark for, for quite a few years and that um, the guys in Germany, companies in Germany were trying to find out how we did it and it became impl implemented in a whole range of different brands. Um, supply chain is, is integral in this process of designing these things. Um, automotive manufacturers became more assemblers and relied on suppliers to design. And so that relationship was really important. And I guess this was a, one of the key points to come out of, out of our, our interviews was that, that make sure that you keep your relationships positive. Because if you fall out with the government and start, um, as one person said, blackmailing them um, to stay, it's not going to end well. Um, and in addition to this, the relationship with the customers didn't survive, that, that um, the vehicles became irrelevant to our customer base. So even though the industry was criticised for being inflexible, it did bring these amazing affordances. Um, it gave a, a, a central purpose for industry to rally around, and it gave the confidence for suppliers to step out on a limb with other smaller projects. And we spoke to a, a range of people who had other innovative projects which have now, and because of this sort of cross-pollination between the automotive industry and other industries, were able to translate that knowledge into other innovative projects which aren't happening in the same way now. Yeah, access to materials That's right. has changed. The automotive industry was bringing materials in, and, and I think there's, uh, yeah, material supply. That because these these materials were coming into Australia, and stockpiled here for use in the automotive industry, access to these materials was uh, a lot easier for other companies, and there was a supply chain that was established. There's a lot of talk of moving to a, to service design, and a services economy. However, it came, became clear from our interviews that even those people who are in this space recognise that unless you have a, a product within the material world that helps ground those services, then the services uh, have no context. That a product, a system and a service all act together to deliver an experience for a customer. And um, if we don't make the products, then those systems and services are just hollow. On the whole, I mean, there are, that's, you know, there are examples of systems and services that, that exist in total abstraction to the rest, but I, they're very rare. I just thought I'd finish this off. This is, this is a quote from, from one of one of the people that we spoke to. I, I've kind of massaged it a little bit, but um, uh, physical artefacts are not just things in and of themselves. They determine the options available to you. If you no longer make them and just become a licensed specifier for someone else's product, that product may not be suited to the Australian climate or society. But it gets worse if you no longer, if you're no longer in the game of making them, you no longer how, know how they're being made. You behold them to someone else who knows how to make them and who sets up the price. You no longer understand the technology and worse, whatever you would have learned in making, you will no longer gain the knowledge of or be able to apply it to anything else. You literally buy yourself out of an intensely dynamic and powerful educational framework that is only gained through making. So there's a few sort of key takeaway messages, I suppose, that we... Um, we noticed as we were sort of wading our way through the, those data <laughs> and quotes and, and all sorts of really interesting insights. Um, certainly, you know, repurposed sites can offer more than residential accommodation, you know, for innovation to flourish. You know, making things gives us that collective purpose. You know, it's a, it's a key to innovation uh, and connectedness. And, and you'll find even, you know, with our interactions with service design in, in universities, a lot of the people in the, in the less material uh, disciplines are actually coming and wanting to make stuff in industrial design, for instance, 
with their graphic students or their, their computer science students because they realise that that physical prototyping process is actually very useful even in a services and digital world. So we need to sort of also think about, you know, nationally, what, what is this perception of a mobile society as well? You know, products, systems, services need to be at a granular, granular and complex and sophisticated level rather than you know, a top-down policy we make enforced <laughs> way. And it's not just about cars, and I think, you know, Graham touched on this in his lecture, you know, but a range of mobility solutions are required here. It, it needs to be sophisticated, this vision, not you know, one-dimensional. And we haven't actually lost the ability to manufacture yet. We're right at the start of losing it, but we haven't lost it yet. We're still making stuff, and there's still in interesting examples of, you know, new factories like Carbon Revolution setting up for, you know, globally significant carbon fibre wheels, as an example. Um, and the repurposing also of spaces, maker spaces in Footscray, maker spaces in Brunswick, um, where smaller factories are being used by multiple tenants. I think one of our, um, our interviewees, uh, or actually a couple of our interviewees, touched on the fact that manufacturing cars now has changed. It's smaller, leaner, smaller factories. So maybe these big sites need to be re redistributed as multi-tenanted, uh, you know, propositions, um, and what are the new industries that we can fit within those sort of structures and spaces? You know, for us, we've got an obvious problem. We're a small domestic market, and and people like Paul and, and John, you know, have worked tirelessly to be the innovators globally in the automotive industry, and they're known for that because they have had to work with not much on a shoestring, and they're still design cultures that are growing. You know, the design teams are growing at GM. As an example, our students are still wanting to do automotive because they know from a design perspective that's probably the future of where design is here. But what about the making bit? What about the learning from that making? So it might need to be this niche idea, but how, you know, how do we connect to international markets through those niche opportunities? There are limitations, obviously, to this study. It is a qualitative study with only um, five interviews from six potential stakeholders that we... Um, we interviewed, this was, a, I think we were talking at um, afternoon tea um, about sort of, this was about the stories behind what potentially we could flesh out with some bigger studies. So it's not general, but this is really about richness. The richness of the stories told by the people that we engaged through the interviews. So it's deep and rich analysis. Further research, um, there's plenty of people we could be trying to talk to, but really these two last points are, are clear. Um, you know, maybe we need to be a bit more scientific now about what's going on in these tier one, tier two support service industries, what's happened from a numerical perspective. Um, but we also need this qualitative aspect. What does this mean in terms of changes to Australian culture, manufacturing culture, vocational culture, logistics culture, all sorts of different cultures that had been operating around as one of our interviewees described it, the industry anchor of this nation, which was car manufacturing. Thank you.